talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever stay in the garden with him though move not around me before me but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Be well, I'd like to welcome everyone here this afternoon on behalf of Dwayne and the family. I'm so thankful that you're all here. Truly, I am. Just a real quick announcement. If at any point, I know there's a lot of small children. If anyone needs to go to the restroom, there's two in our little fellowship hall, and there's one right here back in the corner at the little coffee bar. And if you need to, any children, start getting a little fussy, feel free. There's a room in there for the kids in the back. Just feel free to make use of it if you would like. So as you know, we are gathered here out of love, honor, sorrow, respect for Dwayne and the family as well, of course, for Marcy, who dare I add to say we are even gathered to rejoice. Marcy is at home with her Lord and no longer in the body that had become sick. And that is praiseworthy. The people who are assembled here are a testimony to the fact that Marcy was loved and also to the fact that you who loved Marcy are loved. If you would, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you this afternoon for your son Jesus who has defeated death. 
I praise you that Marcy's death came as no surprise to you. I praise you that you are a comforter to those who mourn. I ask that this afternoon and evening be a blessed time of reflection on the life of Marcy. I ask that every man, woman, and child here this afternoon would have their thoughts turned to eternity because of Marcy's death. In Jesus' name, amen. Strong, let the poor say I am. Does some wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made? I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art And when I think That God his son Sparing sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on that cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then Sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee. Francis Marcia Lewis. Marcy passed away peacefully in her home in Cleburne, Texas on July 8, 2024. She was born May 19, 1945 to Ralph and Francis Mitchell. She is survived by her husband, Dwayne, 55 years of marriage. She is also survived by her three children, Justin, 
Lynn, and Dustin, as well as eight grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. Marcy was a woman of faith in her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Her primary wish for her children and grandchildren was for them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Marcy worked in the baking industry for many years. Banking, not baking, banking, as well as retail management. She was a devoted mother and grandmother and loved to crochet, sew, and quilt. You've probably already noticed there's a few quilts around and those are just a small sampling of what they have had in storage, what has been given away, what has been made over all the years. Making these quilts was a skill that she picked up from her mother-in-law, Virgie Lewis. She also loved gardening and flowers. Her home was always the one with the best yard and flower beds as noticed by all the envious neighbors. During the last five years of her life, she and Duane have lived with their son Dustin and his five children, and their time together was blessed. For my part, and for many in this church body, we came to know Duane and Marcy later in their lives. We didn't get the opportunity to know them in their younger years. The times that I've sat with Duane and Marcy as Marcy would recall her youth, she never failed to speak of the years, which had obviously le left a very strong impression on her of working in the store that her parents owned. Often, when she would speak of this time in her life, tears would begin to fill her eyes. I, like many here, will miss Marcy, but praise be to God, she is now with her Savior. sins and griefs to bear and what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often forfeit oh what needless pain we We do not care
Les said that we're here to rejoice in the life that Marcy lived. That means we're to celebrate the life she lived. And so I don't want to catch you off guard if this message is a little bit weighty, but that's in order to honor Marcy and Dwayne's request and in order to honor the Lord Jesus. But before I get into our message, it is a little bit sobering. I just want to preface it with this, a little bit of lightness. If you're warm out there, I'm really warm up here, okay? <laughs> I'm sweating bullets. <laughs> so being a gardener, which I and my wife are not, meant that Marcy loved to dig in the dirt. This is fitting, for we know that from the dirt we came, and guess what? To the dirt we shall return. God's word declares it is appointed unto men once to die, and then comes the judgment. Everyone is going to taste of death. All of us, barring the return of Jesus himself, will taste of death. That is your, and I'm going to give you a Hebrew word here, and I want you to remember it. That is your aharit. The aharit in Hebrew denotes the end of a thing or the future of a thing. And then will come the judgment of God. That is your future. But Aharit doesn't just speak of the end of this life, but the results of any course of action that we take. One of the areas that Aharit is mentioned in the scripture speaks of the result of a foolish young man who allows himself to be seduced by another man's wife. If he had only known what the result would be, if he had only known the anger of the husband, the offended husband, if he'd only known of the disease that would set into his body, if only he could have had another chance. Do y'all know what a mulligan is? Many of you do? Well, for those of you that don't, uh, the term is most often equated with golfing. A mulligan denotes a second chance at something. And so you're, pr you're playing a friendly game of golf, and you just make a bad shot, and it slices to the left or to the right. You look at your buddy, can I get a mulligan? and you get a do-over. A mulligan is a second chance to perform an action, usually after the first chance went wrong. Again, the term is most often used in golf. How many mulligans would so many of us here love to have? How many do-overs if we had only known the consequences of some of our decisions? If we had only known the aharit, what the end result would be of the path that we had chosen? How often would so many if they had only known the result of a decision or action would produce, would plead with their past selves not to take that road, not to travel that path. Unfortunately, most things in life don't come with the offer of a mulligan. That's why it's so important that we get things right now. All of us only get a little dash between two dates. Marcy's was May 19th, 1945 to July 8th, 2024. That's it. It's really not a long time in the big scheme of things. One little dash, that's all you get. Marcy and her family were allowed to prepare themselves for her death as they were all aware that it was approaching. Not everyone is given this notice. When will your dash end? Only God knows. It could sneak up on you in a moment. That's why it's so important to know why you are here and invest in only the best things, the right things, and most importantly, the God things. This afternoon, I want you to know definitively that you were made for three things. You were made for worship, you were made for work, and you were made for the Word. Worship, work, and the Word. You only have two choices in worship, and it's kindred brother, the work that comes out of it. God's word in Romans 1.25 tells us, Paul writing says, who, he's speaking of humanity, says, they have changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. 
Amen. This is the truth. You are either worshiping and serving God, or you are worshiping and serving created things. Worship is to reverence and give oneself in pursuit and service or work to the object of your worship. And according to God's word, there are two directions that worship and work can be directed. You will either worship and serve God, the creator of all things heavenly and earthly, who created you and he loves you, or you can worship and serve that which he has created. All, without exception, have chosen the latter in one way or another, to one degree or another, whether you realize it or not. All have changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. Sitting with Duane after Marcy's passing and just regaling about her life and the life they had together, Duane had shared with me that when they got married, Marcy had given Duane two ultimatums. Meet these two ultimatums or hit the road, Jack. Two ultimatums. She said, we will be in God's house we will go to church. So which will it be? The church that she had been attending or the one that Duane was attending? And not just attending. It's one thing to be in the building. It's another thing to be the church. In church, she would help in the choir. She would help the pastor as needed. She would teach VBS. She would teach Sunday school. That was the one ultimatum. They had to be in church, and they have been. The other is... Marcy had worked at a bank and she saw too often what happened to so many marriages when they weren't in unity over their finances and they had their separate accounts and went their separate ways and that's not what she wanted for her and Duane. So she had said that one of them was going to have to be the caretaker of the money. As she worked at a bank and as Duane had never even had a bank account, the decision for them was quite easy. Marcy saw to their finances. From their shared income, with Marcy's oversight, no matter their financial situation, whether they had much or whether they had little, first and foremost, the two of them always gave to God. These ultimatums were the outflow of a heart of worship towards God. To not just go to church, but to be actively involved in what God desires to do in the earth, to serve Him and to give unto God what is His. A life not merely lived in pursuit of the things that he's created, but rather to pursue him, the giver of all good gifts. I heard an evangelist that I greatly admire many years ago telling a story about when we begin to worship the created. And he, relate, he related the story in this manner. When his children were little, um, before everyone had two and three televisions in their home, they had not had a television. And so he had made the decision to purchase a television to put in their living room for his children to watch some of the cleaner entertainment that was available at the time. Now, leading up and prior to owning this television, every time dad would come into the home, guess what the children did? Ran to the door to greet dad, throw their arms around dad. Dad, we're so glad you're home. But no sooner than they had the television, you can imagine what began to happen. Little by little, as dad would come home, there were no more excited children running to the door to greet dad. They were too engrossed in the gift that had been given. And so dad, recognizing what was happening, without saying anything to his children when, he, when this had reached its zenith and he had decided enough is enough, he walked in, he's looking at his kids, they don't even acknowledge that he's come in the room. He walks behind the television and unplugs the thing. What happened? And he, he sits his children down and he says, children, I love you. I gave you this gift because I wanted you to enjoy it and the pleasure of it. But if this gift is going to come between you and I, I'm going to kick this thing to the curb. You see, the gift meant for their enjoyment had now caused separation between the children and the giver. In this case, their father. Worshiping and serving the created separates you from the giver. When you get this out of order, there can be dire consequences. For sure, in the life to come, 
but there can even be consequences in the here and now. God gives food for our benefit and even pleasure, but how many people are slaves to food? Their bodies often racked with disease from the lack of the right nutrients, from the right food, or from problems due to overconsumption of the wrong ones. God gives us drink for our benefit and even enjoyment. But how many have been ruined by such things as alcohol? Their livers bruised and beaten by imbibing too often. God even gives us sex for procreation. And wonder of wonder, even pleasure. But how many are slaves to their sexual appetites? Many have bodies that are racked with STDs, which, by the way, never occur when sex is confined to the union of one man and one woman. God's Word has a lot to say when warning against the dangers of sexual lust. Many a family has been wrecked, not just amongst unbelievers, but even amongst believers, because of someone acting on the desire for momentary pleasure. They didn't see the aharit. They didn't see what the end result was going to be. If they'd known what it was going to cost them, they wouldn't have sacrificed everything for that moment. The list goes on. Men will go to great lengths, even breaking their own moral codes to obtain what they so desire. You can worship God and rightly enjoy His good creation, or you can worship the created and be ruled and even ruined by it. In worship of the created, man will often work and work and work some more, all in pursuit of created things, hoping they will somehow find satisfaction. But like the Rolling Stones saying, I can't find no satisfaction. These things will never and cannot satisfy you. That's because they were not designed to be the objects of your worship or of your work. That brings us to being made for the Word. Remember I said you were made for three things. You were made for worship, you were made for work, and you were made for the Word. John 1, verses 1 through 3 tell us this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word, excuse, excuse me, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Everything that we see, the visible and the, uns and the invisible, all created because of Jesus and for Jesus. The word Jesus, God's own son, the image of the invisible God. Jesus is God in flesh. He is to be the object of our worship. Jesus invites you to himself to partake of his life, but there is only one path of possibility to take part in what he offers. Jesus in John 3.3 was visiting with one of the religious leaders of the day. This leader, as some of you are probably familiar, Nicodemus had snuck to Jesus at night for fear of man. He didn't want to be seen speaking with Jesus. He had some questions for Jesus. And Jesus had told him, he said, this is what he says to Nicodemus, he says, Verily, verily, meaning truly, truly, I say unto you, unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Why would Nicodemus, why would you and I need to be born again to experience the kingdom of God? Nicodemus asks, like many of you might have, how could I enter into my mother's womb a second time? What do you mean I must be born again? But Jesus wasn't speaking of physical birth. He was speaking rather of spiritual. You see, you and I have a problem. All humanity has a problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes this. He tells us this. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and he has become the firstfruits of them that slept, meaning of those that have died, he's the first to be resurrected, resurrected to eternity. There were others that were raised from the dead, but they went on to die again. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You because of the actions of our shared ancestors, Adam and Eve, are born in sin and will feel its effect, death. We're, we are sons and daughters of Adam. And because Adam and Eve sinned, God had promised, if you do this thing, you will surely die. And we've been tasting of death and its ramifications ever since. <clears throat> 
But the result of the fall did not just lead to physical death. There was now a spiritual separation. Jesus came to deliver you from death and to give you spiritual life in Him. It should come as no surprise being born in sin to know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Meaning, because of this spiritual separation, because we're sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, and because of their actions, we ourselves are not innocent because we're born in this flesh. And guess what this flesh does? It doesn't immediately find its way unto God. It goes its own way. That's why the scriptures say all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is missing the mark. God created us in His own image to be like unto Him. Created us to be fully human, and yet we've erred. We've not been fully human. We've given place to our animal instincts and went our own way. Sin is not upholding God's Word. In one way or another, all have sinned. All have pointed their worship in the wrong direction. At birth, one man's sin takes him one way and to another a different way. But it all ends in the same place, for the wages of sin is death. I said at the beginning of this that it is appointed unto man once to die, and then comes the judgment. And when you stand before the Lord, He's not going to judge you based on your neighbor. I know that we can all often find someone we think that is worse than ourselves. But that's not God's measuring rod. He's not going to measure you compared to your neighbor. He's going to measure you compared to His holy standard. <clears throat> Mankind has long pondered death and what might come after. Many of you may have heard, many an atheist say something along the lines that the reason that Christians and many others of other faiths hope of a resurrection comes from the imagination of weak-minded individuals who need more than what is to be found here. But I'm here to tell you that's not where this hope comes from. That's not where this longing for eternity comes from. I would say there is a reason. Not just Christians, but most of humanity have hoped for some sort of heavenly eternity. The reason is, is that you were made for it. You were made for the Word. And in Him is life. And He is the light of men. And He is returning, not this time to offer salvation, but judgment. Now I want to read a verse real quickly, and we're, and we're getting close to the end here. We're almost done. But it's a verse that most all of you are probably familiar with. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. Now, so many people, whether they're in the church or outside of the church, are familiar with that verse. But yet, so many people are not familiar with the verses that immediately follow. I'm just going to read you a few of them. John 3.16, we've read John 3.17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's His desire. He desires to save. Save from what? Save from the ramification and result of sin. <laughs> Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is, guess what? Condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And here is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. He's offering salvation but we cling to the darkness rather than stepping into the light. I want you to think for a moment. Jesus is the epitome of love. Scripture tells us God is love. He never lied to anyone. He never walked with His disciples, met their wives, and lusted after their wives secretly in His heart. He was the best friend and is the best friend you can ever have. Would never do you wrong. And yet for all of that, because His righteousness shined on their darkness, they killed Him for it because they loved the darkness. See, often we think that people rejecting Jesus has to do with, it just seems like incomprehensible that you would believe these things. And that may be true for some. They're walking in deception. But the reason that many are not coming to Christ is because they love their sin too much. Now, if you'll allow me, I'm going to, a, a really quick story of many years ago just to show you what I'm talking about. 
If you had known me in my youth in Christ, I was very zealous for evangelism and I could hardly go anywhere without stopping and talking to someone about Jesus. During this season of my life, I was courting my now wife. I had left her house. It was a weeknight. I had to get up early in the morning to go to work and all I wanted to do was get home. I was on my motorcycle. It was raining. I couldn't go as fast as I wanted because I, it, it, the roads were just so slick. And to boot, I needed gas. I didn't want to stop to get gas. Gas is often a great inconvenience, but I needed gas. So I go to pull over at the gas station, and immediately my spirit starts burning because there's a group of teenagers, about six or seven of them, uh, just kind of acting a fool at the gas pump next to me. And I felt the Lord say, go and talk to them. And I thought, Lord, no, not tonight. I just want to go home. But you can't tell the Lord no if he's truly Lord. You see, to believe on the Lord isn't just an intellectual exercise. It's to truly put your trust in him and recognize that he's bought you and redeemed you. You're no longer your own boss. He's the boss. Okay, boss, help me. You know I'm not good at starting conversations, Lord. How do you want me to start this conversation? Make an opportunity. Open a door. Hey, bud, we ain't got no gas money. Can you help us? I would love to. However, you have to do me a favor. I'd like to talk to you guys for a minute. I won't regale you with all the details of the conversation, but I began to talk to them about what I'm talking to you about, that there's a coming day of judgment. And I talked to them about sin. I talked to them about lying and stealing and, and, and walking in lust and all the things that God has said. Don't do these things. And all the while that I'm doing this, one of the young men in the background, who I had recognized immediately as struggling with homosexuality, this young man began to jump up and down in the parking lot. And I thought, my, I've never had a response like this before. I had not talked to him about being a homosexual. I had, talk about, I had talked about the sins that are common to all of us. And so he stops the conversation and he says, will you tell me something? How does God feel about homosexuality? And I said, honestly, I said he hates it. I said, however, he also hates adultery and he hates fornication. I said, he hated the adultery that was in my heart. I said, but you know what he did for me? When I came to him, he forgave me and, it, and he kept his promise. He said, I will give you a new heart, a tender heart, a heart that wants to follow after me. And he did. And he gave me his spirit so that I don't have to give place to those things. And I told this young man, I said, and you know what? I believe he can do the same for you. He can give you a new heart with new desires. He can change all that. And this is what that young man said to me. He, he dropped his head and he said, you know, I believe what you're saying is true. He said, however, I enjoy this lifestyle too much. I said, I'm really sorry to hear that. I said, I'm going to be praying for you. And he said, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your honesty because it was revelatory and it aligned with the scriptures. Why don't men come to Christ? Because they cling to the darkness. Reading John 3.16, we see that those that are his will live with him in eternity and those that reject him will go into damnation. You see, God knows what you need. Mankind's longing for something more is by divine design. You experience thirst, and lo and behold, there's drink. You experience hunger, and lo and behold, there's food, there's sustenance. You experience sexual desire, and lo and behold, there's the design of man and woman and marriage given of God. But the reason there is a knowing in your knower the reason there is a knowing in your knower that there's something more is because there is. Because God has placed it there. God being the designer and creator, you wouldn't experience hunger if there wasn't a way to satiate that hunger. You wouldn't experience a longing for eternity if there wasn't an eternity. You, like Marcy, will someday shed this skin that you have been given for this side of eternity. Every one of you sitting here, this is just your earth suit. I borrowed that from Steve. 
All that Marcy has done is shed her earth suit. The Lord promises that we're going to receive new bodies. We don't know exactly what they're going to be like, but He's promised it. Noticing as I came in here and there were a bunch of flowers on the doorstep, it just got me to thinking about the shedding of this earth suit. All these flowers that have been cut and beautiful as they are, we all know that having been removed from the soil, what's going to happen to these flowers? They're going to wither and die. And so you too, if you're removed from the God that created you, you will wither and die. It is only in Christ that you can find life. And it's only in Christ that you get to experience resurrection and on the day of judgment, not go to damnation, but go to heaven with the one that has purchased you and gave his life for you. This life is so short and we don't often get mulligans, but Christ is offering you so much more than just a do-over. A mulligan doesn't even come close to what Christ is offering to mankind. He is offering you new life. Not just a do-over, but a brand new life. He is offering you the only thing that can satisfy you, and that's Himself. Jesus, God in the flesh, is to be the object of your worship. Nothing else can or will satisfy. Nothing and no one else can save you from sin. I pray that each of you, if you've not already, would put your trust in Him. And I pray that if you've done that before, but you, you have slipped, you've erred, you've been to begin to go your own way, and you've, you're not pursuing after the Lord like you know you ought, that you would repent today. And you know what He's going to do? He's going to welcome you right back. It said, the Scriptures say that His mercies are new every morning. I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father, we again come before You this afternoon. And to everyone here who may not know you or who may have strayed away from you, I pray that you bless them and draw them unto yourself, Lord. I thank you again in this place for the life of Marcy. I thank you for her life that has blessed others, Lord. We just bless you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.